Hello everyone, welcome to our fifth Peace Studies lecture series, the first one in this semester. I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our today's speaker, who is a special guest, oral speakers and guests within our Peace Studies lecture series are special, but this one is especially special. I came across the name of Margaret Barker long time ago when I, by chance, more or less attended one of her lectures and I was deeply fascinated by the methodology she was using and by the scope of the topic, topics that she addresses in her work. As you, some of you may know, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'll explain briefly, her approach is focused on the temple, first temple of Jerusalem, and she is the founder of what is now called temple theology. What it means and what, in practical terms, is what, what her theological method looks like uh, will become clear from her lecture, so I won't go into that uh, at this point more into detail. Uh, but for the purposes of the lecture, Today, she will be addressing not temple theology in general, but temple theology and the uh, concept of temple Jerusalem vis-a-vis -vis the covenant of peace. She published numerous books. To give you just a sense of the range of topics, I'll read a couple of titles that this way or the other are related to uh, the topic that she is going to talk about today. Uh, one of them is Temple Theology, an Introduction, the Great High Priest, the Temple Roots of Christian Liturgy, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Risen Lord, the Jesus of History as the Christ of Faith, on Earth as it is in Heaven, the Great Angel, the Gate of Heaven, the Lost Prophet, and I think uh, the most uh, recent one is a trilogy that involves also the Lady of the Temple. So there are many interesting points that Margaret Barker uh, addressed in her works up to this point, and there are many more interesting arguments and uh, themes that she is exploring right now, and we are very happy to have her with us today. Please. An interesting coincidence that this very weekend the Mormons are dedicating their new temple in Rome which is quite an extraordinary coincidence there you go I'm going to talk this evening about the temple and the covenant of peace there was a temple in Jerusalem for over a thousand years there may have been a temple in the city before it was captured by King David, about 1000 BC, but there is no record of this. The temple we're considering today was built by his son Solomon and dedicated about 950 BCE. It was damaged by enemies many times, repaired and restored, and was finally destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. To reconstruct the temple and its world, we depend on written sources, mostly composed long after the events they describe, and so influenced by memories both affectionate and hostile. The temple built by Solomon was almost certainly destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, and rebuilt after about 70 years by people who had been taken as exiles to Babylon and were eventually allowed to return and restore their city. These people also preserved and compiled most of the Hebrew scriptures. 
They didn't have entirely good memories of Solomon and his temple. He was a wise man, yes, but he married foreign women. He sold territory to the king of Tyre to pay the huge debts incurred in building the temple. And he subjected his own people to forced labor to build it. And when he died, the people demanded an end to forced labor. When his son and heir refused the request, most of the kingdom seceded and the city of Jerusalem was left with a huge temple and very little territory. A generation before it was destroyed by the Babylonians, King Josiah had purged the temple in 623. He removed many cult items, banished many priests, closed the rural holy places. The account in the Bible implies that this was good, and Protestant scholars call it King Josiah's reform. Pressure for this revolution had been building for over a century since the time of the prophet Isaiah, and in his book we see the first signs of what was to come. The revolutionaries and their heirs collected and preserved the holy books which today form the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, and it is assumed that theirs was the only voice and theirs was the only story. Other voices, however, told a very different story. They said that the temple purges had been a disaster when the older faith was destroyed. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls was a text that modern scholars have called the Damascus Document. This considers the time after the temple purges to be the age of divine wrath, the time when the Lord hid his face. Whoever wrote this text was one of the people who fled from the new ways in Jerusalem. Another text with a similar view is the first book of Enoch, which has been preserved only in Ethiopic which the early Christians considered to be scripture. It includes a cryptic history of Jerusalem, which says that in the time of Isaiah, people in the temple lost their spiritual sight and forsook wisdom. Then the temple was burned and the chosen people were scattered. The people who built the second temple, that is those exiles who returned from Babylon, were an apostate generation people who had abandoned the older faith. And in their view, the Hebrew scriptures do not describe the original beliefs of Solomon's temple, but the views of the cultural revolutionaries who destroyed the older faith just before the Babylonians destroyed the actual temple. The covenant of peace, which is our interest today, was the worldview of the first temple. The name Jerusalem includes the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, and the name itself may mean the foundation of peace or he will see peace. One of the great kings was named Solomon, another name that includes the word peace. And so a covenant of peace is almost to be expected in the temple built in Jerusalem by Solomon. Some traces of this worldview escaped the work of the Second Temple scribes and can still be detected in the Hebrew text. More has survived in texts from the people who fled from the Age of Wrath. Some fragments, usually identified as later fictional additions to the biblical stories, are in fact memories of the old ways. One of these is the story of how Isaiah and his disciples fled from Jerusalem and took refuge in the desert. Others, like the Damascus document, give details. This text begins by describing how some people were unfaithful and forsook the Lord. He hid his face from them and from the temple, but a faithful remnant remained who fled to the desert. They were the faithful priests who would one day return to all the glory of Adam. The prophet Isaiah, who lived at the beginning of this turmoil, used the same images. His people had rejected the gentle waters of Shiloh, and he warned them that they would be overwhelmed by the mighty river of Assyria. 
The Lord, he said, was hiding his face. One of his sons was named Shia Yashuf, which means a remnant shall return, and the child was to be a living sign. Isaiah said that he lived among people of unclean lips, which means they had false teaching, and he, or perhaps a later disciple, wrote about the covenant of peace. He also wrote about the virgin who would bear a son to rule in Jerusalem, about virgin daughter Zion who would defend her city against enemies, about the woman who proclaimed to her people the good news that they would return to their home, about the afflicted woman who was also the city who would be rebuilt and have more children. Isaiah knew of a lady of the temple who has almost disappeared from the accounts of Solomon's temple. Her sacred spring was the Gihon where the kings were anointed and the waters that flowed from it were the gentle waters of Shalach that represented her teachings which had been rejected. The first book of Enoch said the people had lost their spiritual sight when they rejected wisdom, wisdom with a capital W. Wisdom then was one of the ladies' names or titles. The covenant of peace and the Lady of the Temple, with her many names and titles, were both purged from the Temple. And as we recover the one, so the other reappears also. The Lady passed into Christianity as Mary, the mother of the Messiah, and the covenant of peace was restored at the Last Supper. When Isaiah wrote about the covenant of peace, he said it would survive a flood like Noah's flood. Quoting, my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace shall not be removed. It was a covenant of chesed. This is a Hebrew word that's very difficult to translate. I shall just translate steadfast love. And this is the first of the words by which we can identify the covenant of peace. In the biblical story of Noah's flood, the covenant was called the everlasting covenant, and its sign was the rainbow. Quoting again, I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. That's Genesis chapter 9. When the oracles and writings of Isaiah and his disciples were collected into one book, someone wrote a preface which describes the great changes in Jerusalem over the centuries. The people of Jerusalem, it says, had rebelled against the Lord, the temple cult had become insincere, righteousness no longer lived there, the faithful city had become a harlot. Instead of the lady in Jerusalem, whom Isaiah called virgin daughter Zion, there was another female figure. We see her in the book of Revelation as the harlot city who was drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs and who was burned as the saints rejoiced. And then the lady returned, the bride of the Lamb. And Isaiah's preface sums the situation up, how the faithful city has become a harlot, she that was full of justice, righteousness once lodged there, but now murderers. And here there are two more key words for the covenant. The word justice, translating here the Hebrew mishpat, which means giving a right judgment. And righteousness, here, sedek, which is the action that follows. And so the covenant of peace can be summed up as based on loving kindness, chesed, which leads to a right judgment, justice, mishpat, which leads to right action, righteousness, sedek, and this leads to peace, shalom. Now, the Lady of the Temple was the heavenly mother of the king, and his role was to uphold the covenant of peace. Psalm 72 is a prayer for this ideal king, and it describes his reign. Quoting, Give the king thy justice, O God, thy righteousness to the royal son, 
May he judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with justice. Here are those key covenant words, justice and righteousness. But the king's justice and righteousness didn't just affect human society, they also impacted upon the whole creation. Later in the same psalm we read, let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. But Isaiah had a vision and he saw the covenant broken. He described the creation collapsing when the covenant of peace was abandoned. And here he uses the other name, the everlasting covenant. And this is quoting from Isaiah chapter 24. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore a curse devours the earth. All the visions that are now called apocalyptic, the earth shaking, the stars falling from the sky, the heavens rolled up like a scroll, these are all prophetic visions of the broken covenant. Isaiah said the catastrophe was caused by abandoning God's laws and statutes. Jeremiah, slightly later prophet, said it was because people were skilled in doing evil but did not know how to do good. The prophet Hosea lived at the same time as Isaiah and addressed the same situation. The land was mourning, the people were languishing, even animals, birds and fish were perishing. This was happening, he said, because there was no faithfulness, no loving kindness, no knowledge of God. Quoting Hosea, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. The religious rites were observed, but their meaning had been lost. Hosea also revealed in just one reference that there had been a covenant with Adam. Scholars often amend this line to make it make more sense, sense in inverted commas, because a covenant with Adam is not mentioned anywhere else in the Hebrew scriptures. But this covenant may well have been one aspect of the Adam story that did not survive the work of the Second Temple scribes and editors. It was a covenant of peace, although not named here as such. And then quoting from Hosea, I desire loving kindness and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Like Adam, they transgress the covenant. They deal faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers. Hosea and Jeremiah imply that the covenant of peace involved knowledge. And this fits well with the Adam and Eve story that survives in Genesis. They were intended to eat from every tree, including the tree of life, uh, which was a symbol of the lady, and it imparted her wisdom. But they chose the one forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After this choice, you know the story, they lost Eden and the soil was cursed because of their choice. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. The story Hosea knew, and we can only speculate here, described Adam and Eve in a covenant of peace and the land prospering. But they broke that covenant by abandoning <clears throat> loving kindness and the knowledge of God. Now, knowledge of God here, the word God, is the <clears throat> Hebrew word Elohim, and perhaps that should be translated the knowledge of the angels, which doesn't mean knowing about the angels, it means knowing what the angels know. And this was part of the covenant of peace. But the work of the Second Temple scribes has obscured what this knowledge was. Isaiah knew that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon the Anointed One, his mind would be changed. Hosea described the land of the broken covenant. There is swearing, lying, killing, stealing and committing adultery. They violently cast off restraint. 
This old Greek translation here is slightly different. And instead of cast off restraint, it has, there is poured out on the land. There is swearing, lying, killing, stealing and adultery poured out on the land. Isaiah used his parable about the Lord's vineyard to describe the same situation. It produced no good grapes. There was bloodshed instead of justice and a cry of despair instead of righteousness. Here you've got the two covenant words again, justice and righteousness, but they are replaced by words that sound in the Hebrew very similar. And so mishpat becomes mishpach, and zedakah becomes zedakah. And wordplay like this, giving bloodshed and despair instead of justice and righteousness, this wordplay was characteristic of First Temple discourse and is one of the ways we can recover details of the older ways. When he was called to be a prophet, Isaiah received a vision of the Lord enthroned and he heard heavenly voices proclaiming that the whole earth was full of the glory of the Lord. He knew that his people had adopted false teaching, he said they had unclean lips, and he was sent to warn them of the consequence of this choice. They would hear and not understand. They would see and not perceive. They would not understand so they could not change their minds and be healed. And this state of stupidity would persist until the land and its cities were destroyed. Perception, understanding and spiritual sight were the gifts of the lady. In the first book of Enoch's enigmatic history, when the people of the temple abandoned wisdom, they lost their spiritual sight, the temple was destroyed, and the people were scattered. Isaiah looked forward to a time when the older covenant would be restored, when a king would reign in righteousness, princes rule in justice, you can spot the passages by the covenant words, the catastrophic results of the broken covenant would be, re would be removed. And so we read, then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, the ears of those who hear will hearken, and the mind of the hasty will discern knowledge. But the land would stay desolate until the spirit was poured out from on high, and then justice will dwell in the wilderness, righteousness in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace. The covenant of peace then was the work of the lady here in Isaiah called the spirit, giving her knowledge, which the Bible calls wisdom, so that the creation prospers. And so, Back to the story of the Garden of Eden, which encodes this. Adam and Eve were intended to eat from the tree of life which gave wisdom, but they rejected this and chose instead the knowledge of good and evil. They lost Eden and found that the soil was cursed and barren. Now the Christian story, the meta-narrative in the New Testament, reverses this situation. Jesus promises his faithful followers that they will once again eat from the tree of life. Paul explained that those led by the Spirit were the sons of God who would set creation free from futility and decay. This is his great passage in Romans chapter 8. One of the first Dead Sea Scrolls to be found was a relatively well-preserved text of 11 columns which scholars have called the Community Rule. This copy was made about a hundred times, a hundred years before the time of Jesus, but nobody can say when the original was composed. It describes a group who have entered again into the covenant of chesed, loving kindness, and committed themselves to practicing truth, righteousness, and justice. They prayed to be enlightened with life-giving wisdom, their master taught them the wisdom of the children of heaven and they believed they were chosen for the everlasting covenant to regain all the glory of Adam. So here 
the covenant of peace is called the everlasting covenant and also the covenant of loving kindness, the covenant of chesed. And there are all the familiar covenant words, justice, righteousness, and the people of this covenant knew the wisdom of the angels. The people who used this text and copied it out were contemporaries of Jesus. When Solomon's temple was purged and Isaiah's disciples fled, they took with them the older ways and teachings and they preserved them. They hoped to return to their homeland and to the ways of the older covenant. One of Isaiah's disciples described that time. Someone would be anointed to bring the good news, to build up the ancient ruins and to restore the priests of the Lord. And then I quote, I, the Lord, love justice, mishpat, one of our words, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And this is part of the passage that Jesus read in the synagogue of Naz at Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry, which is identified by its opening verse, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me. And so it was the everlasting covenant, the covenant of peace, that was the framework of Jesus' ministry and teaching. And Jesus restored this at the Last Supper, as we shall see in a moment. Now, the Hebrew word for covenant is berit, and it is closely linked to two other words. One is bara, meaning create, but this verb is only used of divine actions, so we don't know that's the correct way to translate it. The second one is bara, meaning to bind. So the covenant then was imagined as a web of bonds created, perhaps by the Lord, that held creation in place. When Ezekiel described sinful people returning to the covenant, he said that the Lord God would make them pass under his scepter and bring them back into the bond of the covenant. A poem about the lady shows that she wove this covenant. It was imagined as a great fabric. She was with the creator as he shaped the world. This is Proverbs chapter 8. Now the Greek understood the first verb after this as he set me as the foundation. But the Hebrew has a word with two meanings both of which describe the work of wisdom, the lady in creation. This word is nasach, and it can mean either to weave or to pour out. Isaiah spoke of the spirit poured out to renew the creation. Hosea mocked this when he said there is swearing, lying, killing and adultery poured out on the land. And the lady herself called out to her foolish children, this is the preface to the book of Proverbs, Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you, I will make my words known to you. But she warned them that they'd chosen the way to calamity, they had despised her. Now the lady weaving her bonds of the covenant is a bit more difficult to trace. And the first evidence is in Origen's transliteration of Genesis. Origen was a great Christian biblical scholar. He died in 253 CE. And this is in the second column of a work which we call his Hexapla. He read the first line of Genesis not as in the beginning God created, but by means of the net God created. The letters of the Hebrew text can be read both ways. The lady held the creation in place with her net. The Neophyte Targum, that's a translation, um, Palestinian translation into Aramaic, um, expanded the text as it translated into Aramaic and this combined both possible ways of reading the line and so we have in the beginning with wisdom the Lord created and so the net is represented by wisdom. Christian tradition also remembered the lady's net. One of the orthodox hymns for Pentecost includes the line, Blessed art thou, sending down upon them the Holy Spirit, and thereby holding or catching the universe as in a net. That poem in Proverbs 8 
begins with wisdom weaving at the beginning of creation and ends with her by the creator's side holding all things together. Hebrew word here is amon, which can mean a nursing woman or a faithful person or an artisan. It probably here means all three Hebrew work like that. But the Greek chose Hamadzusa, the woman who holds together in harmony. This was the covenant bond described elsewhere as ways of pleasantness and paths of peace. When the bonds were broken, her son, the Messiah, had to restore them with atonement. Once thought to be a late addition to temple practices, the Day of Atonement is now recognised as one of the earliest rituals whose real significance was largely lost in the Second Temple. The ritual was not, and is not, about appeasing an angry god, but about repairing something that has been torn. The language used, according to the distinguished anthropologist Mary Douglas, means making good an outer layer that has rotted or been pierced. Atonement was restoring the covenant of peace. The ritual involved two goats. One was chosen by Lot to represent Azazel, the leader of the fallen angels, and the other represented the Lord. The goat representing the Lord was sacrificed and the high priest took its blood into the Holy of Holies which represented heaven. Then the high priest sprinkled and smeared the blood in various parts of the temple which represented the creation to cleanse and consecrate, to remove the effects of sin. The high priest absorbed the effects of sin into himself carried them out to the second goat, which then bore them away. Atonement was a ritual to cleanse and heal the creation and human society. Two observations. The high priest in Solomon's temple was the king, and he was the earthly presence of the Lord. He was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When he sacrificed the goat that represented the Lord, he was sacrificing a substitute for himself. In other words, one element of the atonement ritual was healing by self-sacrifice. The later storytellers said it was Aaron's duty, Aaron the high priest's duty, to make atonement. He was entrusted with the covenant of peace because he made atonement for the people of Israel. He was the great healer. Mary Douglas, the anthropologist, made a further observation about the biblical way of dealing with contagious and destructive impurity. We cannot avoid asking the question, she wrote, why the priests defined laws of purity that did not make parts of the congregation separate from or defined as higher or lower than the rest. It was because the covenant of peace held all things together. Atonement was a ritual to include, not to exclude. Paul mentions this, Romans chapter 8, nothing in heaven or earth could exclude him from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the clearest account of this ancient ritual of atonement is Isaiah 53, the fourth of the prophet's poems about the servant of the Lord. The text exists in various forms, and the Christian use of it showed that they knew the form found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is significantly different from the text in the current Hebrew scriptures, which gives us our Old Testament. The servant has understanding, he is raised up on high, he is anointed, and his appearance is changed. The central verse of the song, and this is the key verse, reveals his role. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. That is the traditional translation. But the key words here have two meanings. This is temple discourse. And this word chastisement can also mean covenant bond. And the stripes, the wounds, more often means joining together.
And so this gives a very different picture of the role of the servant. The covenant bond of our peace was his responsibility and by his joining us together, we are healed. The poem ends by affirming that the servant was the sin bearer. He bore the sins of many, so he's a high priest figure. Now, the covenant of peace was the covenant renewed at the Last Supper. There are many covenants in the Hebrew scriptures. And Matthew, writing, <clears throat> writing for a community of Jewish heritage, specified which covenant Jesus renewed. Matthew 26, 28, My blood poured out for many for the taking away, the Greek word is aphesis, of sins. No covenant mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures deals with sin except the covenant of peace that was renewed on the Day of Atonement by the self-sacrifice of the great high priest to restore and heal the whole creation. From earliest times, the Eucharistic prayers have included the Holy, Holy, Holy. This is because the whole creation is restored as the covenant is renewed. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament links the death of Jesus to the Day of Atonement, emphasizing that he offered himself not an animal as a substitute. Paul said that those led by the Spirit were sons of God who would set creation free from its bondage to decay. And he exhorted the Christians in Ephesus to lead a life worthy of their calling, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's that covenant again. John recorded Jesus' teaching after the Last Supper. By this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And the book of Revelation describes the day of judgment as the time when the creation is set free and restored. As the woman clothed with the sun gives birth to her son, that's the lady, who is set on the throne in heaven, the seventh angel blows his trumpet, elders in heaven proclaim the beginning of the kingdom. This is a time for judging the dead, rewarding the saints, and destroying the destroyers of the earth. So the covenant of peace, the eternal covenant, the covenant of loving kindness, is the most fundamental idea in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. It has been almost completely neglected. Isaiah's warning that his people of unclean lips would lose the gifts of spiritual sight and discernment is the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament. The original vision saw all creation and human society bound into one great covenant web, which is the net of the Lady Wisdom. Breaking those bonds brought disaster. The covenant of peace based on love, which leads to right judgment, right action and peace, was the original vision. Wisdom, rather than knowledge, is the key to upholding this covenant and it is sustained by self-sacrifice that enables healing. This is the covenant that Christians celebrate and renew at the Eucharist. Now, Paul had this covenant of peace and its imagery in mind when he wrote to the Christians in Rome about their new way of thinking. And he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure you have a lot of questions or comments or ideas in your mind, and I'm sure that Margaret is willing to uh, answer those questions you might have, so please. Yes. I, I'll start out. I have a few different questions. Yes. Um, so my first question is uh, applying the covenant to today. Yeah. So when you look at Israel, how are they making use of, uh, you know, covenant language in terms of like 
their own nationalist purposes. And then that said, the role of women in the temple also seemed important, and it's especially important. Yeah. Well, the first thing is I can't tell you anything about how uh, Israelis are currently using their scriptures. Mm -hmm. What I can do, and clearly I'm working as a Christian Hebraist, mm -hmm. is look at what was the fundamental um, vision, the fundamental premise upon which classical Hebrew scripture teaching is built. Mm -hmm. and it's quite clear that that has been obscured and that this is what the Christian movement set about trying to restore. Mm -hmm. um, that also got obscured, as we know, to our cost. So I can't answer your first question. Now the second question about, can you say it again so we can all hear, because sure. it was I'm, carefully worded, yes. I'm curious to know more about the role of women in terms of the covenant, because then you spoke about how um, mm. the Virgin Mary was, I guess, the, the rebirth of that in the Christian narrative. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so just in well, the role of Mary um, in fact, it is, is hugely important now in, in biblical scholarship and uh, study of the early church. I mean, there's a, there's a growing movement. Um, but curiously, this has not gone hand in hand with pressure for women to have a greater role, public role, mm -hmm. in churches. This is one of those mysteries that I simply cannot understand because if some of these you know, women who had felt called to a public role in the church, an ordained role in the church, if some of these women knew just a small amount of this older, authentic biblical material, they would have had a much stronger case. I mean, I followed with great interest all the debates about ordaining women and then having women bishops in the English scene. And not once did any of this amazing material get mentioned. And I find that, you know, one of, one of the great mysteries of the church, I mean, is to quote. Um, but I think if those two streams come together, things might happen. But certainly, um, there is a very interesting book in the press at the moment by um, Ali Katus, an American scholar, quite a fiery lady, I suspect. And I, I, I read the um, <clears throat> manuscript and said, yes, 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 and wrote a bit for the back cover, you know, you asked to do. And she is showing all sorts of amazing things about me, uh, the wisdom high priest in early Christian um, depictions, visual depictions of Mary. So watch that space because all sorts of things are happening. Um, and who knows, the first female pope might have been born already. You never know. As a thought. I'm um, interested to know how other biblical scholars have reacted to this uh, this concept. Usually with silence, because it's not what biblical scholarship is currently doing in its fashionable manifestations. Uh, we've got all sorts of current trends and fashions and so forth, um, which are fine and their things to do and so forth, I do question the relevance of some of them to the actual consumers of the scriptures, namely the Christian congregations. Now, I'm a Methodist preacher, so three Sundays in four, I'm in a pulpit in front of a congregation. And afterwards, we have this happy time that they call social talk over coffee when what I say gets pulled apart, which is fine. That's how you learn. But I think if some of my learned colleagues doing the more rarefied aspects of currently fashionable Old Testament, if they were in that situation, well, they couldn't be in that situation because nothing they're doing is of any relevance to the consumers. Now, could you run a corporation if nobody wanted your product? Nope. This is the problem. This is the big problem. Um, the pressure certainly in England, and it's the, uh, that's the only scene I know, is that you have to try and do biblical studies without actually being religious. And so you do literary theory and feminist critique and post cologne all these which are very interesting. But in the end, they're not the stuff that feeds the community of the faithful. And you do have to be very clear about that. Um, so, Biblical studies relevant to 
Christian communities is hanging by a thread in England, certainly, which is quite interesting. Hmm. It's worrying. It's very, very worrying. But I can add to that uh, how the ecclesial establishment often reacts to Margaret's works, just by, I'll illustrate that uh, by one fact that I learned just yesterday, that in one year, Margaret Barker was quoted in one year, at the same time, by Patriarch Bartholomew, Orthodox Patriarch, Pope Benedict the 16th, and Archbishop Canterbury, Rowan Williams. Rowan Williams, yeah. Only happened once, but it happened once. <laughs> That's fine. That's the best peer review you could get. Um, <clears throat> so, there are other ways to do biblical scholarship than this really very destructive stuff that is happening. Biblical scholarship is being hollowed out from inside. And it's going to be like something that's been hollowed out by termites. Quite soon it's just going to do that. That's very sad. Um, but, you know, if the Lord spares us, some of us will be able to carry on. But this approach is hugely relevant to the pressing question of a Christian stance on the environment. Um, I mean, it's fundamental. You cannot do creation theology. You, you must, Christians shouldn't talk about uh, environment because that suggests that the human being is at the centre. You know, it's the French environ, it's around us. We talk about creation and creation theology and the whole concern for the world. And nobody can be neutral about that now. And the church simply does not have a characteristic position. It takes a secular position from various other places, dresses it up with a few Hebrew texts and things like that, sometimes not even appropriate texts. And this second-hand recycled stuff is presented as, as the official position. Well, that's disastrous. You've got to start again from grassroots and say, let's look at the foundation documents, let's look at what we've got, and build on that. That's the problem. We've got a huge amount and it's just not being used. Um, so one thing you said about the older religion yeah. is that the high priest and the king yeah. were one and the same. Yes. I'm wondering um, what happened to that because obviously um, in what you're saying is the older um, I mean, the newer interpretation in, like, the Mosaic covenant the, 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 definitely separate figures. I, yes, they're, that they're definitely separate because um, the, the Mosaic manifesto, as we know it, the best um, example of it is the book of Deuteronomy, and that is really quite hostile to monarchy. And the, the whole idea of having a sacral king, which is, you know, the kind of proper term for this, uh, is just uh, anathema to them. And unfortunately, we only have texts that are, have come through, largely come through their editorial process. Now, the, the, the group of, oh, the, the name of the kingship, the old royal kingship, was the priesthood of Melchizedek the righteous king Melchizedek. And he only has two bit parts in the Old Testament. He's got, you know, a couple of verses in Genesis. And then he's got one verse in Psalm 110. That's it. Nobody, until a few years ago, could understand why the New Testament book of Hebrews made such a fuss about Jesus as Melchizedek. Jesus as the new Melchizedek. Where they got all this from? And then... A very interesting text was found, or fragments of a text were found, at Qumran, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which shows the huge importance of Melchizedek. He was a divine figure. He was expected to return as the Messiah. He was going to re-establish the true priesthood, rescue his faithful followers, all these things. And once you realise that that text which was in use in the time of Jesus, once you realise that that could have been known to and probably was known to the people reading the book of Hebrews and the original Christian Gospels, you can pick up Melchizedek all the way through, even when he's not mentioned, because there are certain things that are kind of, you know, Melchizedek tunes that you can suddenly hear. For example, Jesus' first sermon 
in Nazareth, Luke chapter 4. And he takes us his text. He reads from Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61 is the theme music of the Melchizedek text. So by choosing that text, Jesus is immediately sending a message to the people hearing him. When he says, uh, this is fulfilled today in your hearing, they say in effect, oh, it can't be you, we've known you since we were a boy. Very interesting. And yet there are other motifs through all the Gospels, particularly in John's Gospel. Melchizedek absolutely waves to you, but not by name. And so we have the restoration, if you like, of the Melchizedek priesthood in, in the church. And the Aaron priesthood obviously is associated with the work of the revolutionaries who emphasised Moses. Moses was there before, obviously, but they, they really um, made Moses the great figure who is going to replace the king. So Moses is the lawgiver. And we've got no in the Old Testament, very little at all of laws coming from 500 years of kings. What happened to them? What happened indeed? Editors are very powerful people, as anyone knows who's ever written a book. So, um, hmm? they, the, when the Maccabees took, yeah. um, they took both the kingship and the high priesthood, right? Yes. And, um, they were a priestly family. The Maccabees were a priestly family, yes, and that was one of the things that they were... The theory I've heard about yes. Melchizedek is that he was emphasized by them. He was, yes, so indeed. they could sort of justify taking both roles. That's them. right, yes. And this In is... Your idea, do you think they were working with this older covenant of peace? Or? Uh, I think they were probably trying to reclaim the temple. Well, they were. We know this because the, the Syrian forces had occupied it and polluted it and all the rest of it. Um, but certainly these, uh, these images, these motifs were around for them to use. Whether they use them well or not is a different matter because if you know the story of the Maccabees, they were not all as good as they might have been. Um, and it descended into a very nasty bloodbath in the end. And then Pompey put an end to that, which was even worse. Uh, but certainly the Melchizedek priesthood and the restoration of that, and with it the coming of the Messiah, that was a hugely hot topic in the time of Jesus. They expected to melt, they got a sacred calendar which they, used to, they worked on in the temple, and that was between, if I can remember this right, between 17 and, I think it was somewhere around 24 AD uh, CE. Now, Jesus was born 7 or 6 BC, and if you do your, your sums, you'll realise that Jesus' public ministry, when he was about 30 years old, that's what Luke tells us, begins almost exactly when the sacred calendar said Melchizedek would return. Now that's very interesting indeed. I don't think that's coincidence. So there's all sorts of things like this, but without that find among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we would not have been able, from the biblical evidence, to put that together. Once we've got this huge missing piece, you can suddenly, uh, well, you can reconstruct, for example, the very damaged text of Psalm 110. But you realise now what it must once have been before whoever got hold of it and shredded it. So there's, there's a lot of work to do. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, two silly questions probably. Uh, the first one, I was wondering how Moses and the commandments fit in your story of the commandment. Can you speak up please? Yeah. yeah. I was wondering uh, how Moses and the commandments fit in your story of the covenant. Right. Please. And secondly, yeah. uh, uh, how would you interpret, in the framework of your uh, presentation, how would you interpret Jesus' the prophecy of the destruction of the temple? Right, well those are two very interesting questions, very different. Um, the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments uh, comes from one strand of Hebrew tradition. And there is another strand which doesn't actually mention Moses and the Ten Commandments. And that's the strand that is linked to Jerusalem. If you look at that 
enigmatic history of Jerusalem, which I mentioned briefly in the first book of Enoch. Uh, that tells the whole history of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom and doesn't mention Moses or the Ten Commandments. So that tradition seems to have come from another part of the people. Remember, you know, tr traditionally there's ten tribes. At some stage, editors got to work and wove all the traditions together. This is why we have <coughs> such problems um, identifying, for example, divine names in the Hebrew scriptures. Because some used one name, some used another, some used a whole collection, some have got completely mistranslated. El Shaddai does not mean God Almighty. It's the name of a female deity. It means the divine being who has breasts. Well, that's not God Almighty, that's the lady. But you see, as the strands were woven together, Moses is given this place in what is on the surface of it, a historical account, but in fact it's weaving together all the strands which were before about 500 BC were actually the traditions of separate groups of the people. And so Moses in the Ten Commandments goes way back, but it's part of a subset within ancient Israel. And it's only later that it's woven in to the history of the city of Jerusalem, as it was told. And if you look much later on, at the end of the Second Temple period, you find that Moses has taken over most of the roles of the old sacral kings. And so when Moses goes up Sinai, it's described as though it's the old sacral king going up into the Holy of Holies to receive wisdom from the Lord. And in fact, it's Moses going up to receive the Ten Commandments. So they kind of put the two stories, which are broadly similar, on top of each other. And Moses is then declared to be the God and King of his people. Well, Exodus doesn't tell you that. But an Egyptian writer named Philo, who was an exact contemporary of Jesus, he's very happy to write this in his life of Moses. Moses, the God and king of his people, entered into the darkness where God was. We've met this person somewhere before, and in those days, he was the Melchizedek priest. So there was a lot of this weaving together. And the job of Old Testament scholars is to take it apart, find where it's come from. Now, what was your second question? Yes, Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the... <clears throat> well, Jesus certainly prophesied the destruction of the temple. And it happened, and Christians used to visit. The earliest pilgrimage to Jerusalem is actually looking at the ruins of Jerusalem to say, yes, the prophecy was fulfilled. Because going back to the, <clears throat> going back to the school of Isaiah, the time of Isaiah, there was a group of people holding to the older faith and they never accepted the second temple because they said it was unclean, impure. It didn't have in it the correct furnishings. They said the glory of God was diminished. And they looked for the destruction of Jerusalem. And so Jesus prophesying the destruction of a wicked city is actually all part of the hopes of the older believers. If you trace all those terrible pictures, well you get them starting in Isaiah, about a harlot, that's the, um, the kind of wicked counterpart of the lady of the temple. And all the things that are said about the harlot are the exact opposite. So she is the lady of stupidity, not the lady of wisdom. Uh, she's full of uncleanness, she's not pure, all these things. Um, and you can trace this right through until you get the picture language of the book of Revelation where the harlot, and she's a dreadful woman, and she's dressed up exactly like a high priest. If you look at how she's dressed, she's wearing the high priest colours and all the rest of it. And she burns. That's when Jerusalem is burning. Now, if you look in the laws in the Old Testament, the only crime for which your body was burned 
was being a harlot if you were a woman of the high priestly house. So if you utterly betrayed your role as a woman of the high priesthood, then the punishment was that your body was burned. That's the only example. So we know exactly who this harlot was. She was a high priest that had gone bad and corrupted everything. And you see, Jesus cleanses the temple, drives all these people out. And you know, in John's Gospel, when this happens, it says he makes a whip of cords and he goes and, you know, I mean, a whip of bits of string wouldn't have been a very effective at all. But if you read the um, contemporary instructions to the high priest, and these have survived, as to how you go about the Day of Atonement, what you do, it says you do your ritual sprinkling. They use a bunch of herbs and blood. And they say you have to use the action of a whip. And so anybody going around the temple with this little tiny bunch of string going like this, people who knew about these things, and they were the ones who needed to hear what Jesus was saying, they would have known straight away what this was. This was a cleansing of the temple. That's when the priesthood of the temple, the current priesthood, really turned against Jesus. Yeah. But you have to pick up, I mean, just that half line in John's Gospel, he made a, a, a whip of cords. And you, you can read that story and you think, oh, what a funny thing to do. That wouldn't have been much use, would it, with all those animals and things. And then you put it in context. Um, so Jesus wanted rid of the current temple, and he wanted to restore the true temple. Hmm. And that's how we got into the covenant. Is it possible that that is actually how we got into it? Can you remember who told you that or who wrote it? Uh, it, it was in a, a book I studied in you know, with my Hebrew course. It yeah. was about the Qumran scrolls and the uh, yeah. of the society. There, there are many similarities, many similarities between um, the worship patterns and all the rest of it of the early Christians and those of the people of Qumran. Perfectly possible that Jesus has contacts with them. More possible indeed is that John the Baptist, his cousin, had contacts with them. Um, whether you could say that there is direct influence, it's very difficult at this distance, but certainly there are enough similarities to the in the documents that we found at Qumran, there are enough similarities to what we think of as characteristically Christian ideas and practices to make it a very likely proximate context for the um, growing up of Christianity. But as with all these things, you can note the similarities. You can't then say, ah, oh, that caused that uh, post hoc, echo hoc, and all that. Um, but certainly, I mean, the Christian thing didn't just kind of arrive. <laughs> well, this is what some people think. And when, you, when you try uh, explaining that all these things had a context, and maybe the Christians didn't take everything wholesale, but they took from here and here, and they were influenced and so forth, and they made of it what was characteristically what became Christianity. But it's very difficult to isolate an original Christianity because there was different bits all over the place, four different Gospels. And they're all telling a slightly different story, uh, perhaps the way they're arranged, all these things. But yes, we've, we've, um, we've got to look very, very carefully at the roots of Christianity outside mainstream Second Temple. And that's going to be a big revolution. One last question. Right. I have one, uh, um, inspired by the Qumran question. Uh, do you see a risk that several of the sources, secondary sources, I may say, so not the mainstream sources, um, uh, may uh, 
does not be directly related to the early times. So many of these sources are late. And how uh, convincing do you think is it to bring them together to reconstruct the first temple? The early temple? That is a very, very big question. I'll go back to the microphone. Um, Sorry to be... It's all right. Uh, one of the problems that has to be acknowledged with biblical scholarship is that biblical texts, we tend to say, you know, without question, oh, it says it was written by Isaiah in the 7th century BC. We believe that. But until the scrolls were found, the earliest text of Isaiah that we had was 1008, wasn't it, in the Leningrad Codex. Oops, now there's a big gap. Um, but nobody ever questioned the date of Isaiah. But when you come across fragments from Qumran that you can date to about 300 BC of the Book of Enoch. People say, oh, well, there's no evidence for Enoch before 300 BC. It must be late. Well, now, if there's no evidence for Isaiah before 1008, you know, let's have the same arguments for both sides. So <clears throat> what is interesting about trying to do this reconstruction is that in so many peripheral materials, uh, apocryphal, pseudepigraphical, or even fragments like bits from Qumran, there is a certain consistency, which is interesting. Now, <clears throat> uh, you can't argue from that that these must have come from the same thing. What you can say is this is rather like collecting pieces from a huge shipwreck that's washed up here, here, and here. You can have some idea of what the ship was like, but you can't reconstruct the whole ship. A lot of things that have, until recently and in many instances still are, uh, regarded as late additions or just fictional bits. Um, for example, some of the additions that you find in the Targums those show a consistency which suggests that the oral tradition remembered a lot that wasn't put in the severely edited Hebrew text that we now have. That's the first one. Uh, the second one is that a lot of um, things that are, seem to have no basis in the Hebrew scriptures at all, for example, the various legends about Isaiah, they have an interesting kind of common thread that does fit in with a lot. And if you read, for example, the, <clears throat> the, the text called The Ascension of Isaiah, some of the things you read in that fit remarkably closely to this Other Voices program that I'm collecting. And it may be that all the various later authors had a kind of conspiracy to put this about. On the other hand, it may simply have been community memory. And this is, this is the problem. But if you collect all these other sources and collate them and say, this is the hypothesis I put to the Hebrew scriptures as we have them, bearing in mind that they were pointed, they were given their vowels after the advent of Christianity in order to exclude certain ways of reading the Hebrew text. When you take those vowels out and you find you can read the text in a way that is compatible with your hypothesis, that hypothesis gains a lot of strength. So that's how uh, we're working. Now that you need a lot of evidence to turn a hypothesis into a fact and there's a lot to do.